So in 1 Peter, now chapter 4. Looking at the first six verses, 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning. I've entitled this message, Killing Sin Through Suffering. Sounds like a real easy one. <laughs> Killing sin through suffering. Let's read 1 Peter 4, 1 through 6. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. I just want to lower this a little bit. All right, so Peter is continuing with this theme of suffering. We've been hearing a lot about suffering, different kinds. Suffering for righteousness' sake, you know, some kinds of persecution, mistreatment, suffering for the name of Christ. Uh, so when a person turns from their sin and trusts in Christ um, and follows Christ, it, it does not mean now that there is an end to suffering and then everything in life will be improved, which is what you hear oftentimes from perhaps televangelists or others that, uh, and even, even some of the secret sensitive persuasion will kind of say, you know, if you follow Christ, Maybe he'll make you a millionaire, or maybe he'll just he'll fix what's messed up in your life, and you'll be a better worker and a better business person, better this, better that. That's not the gospel, but we hear that quite often. So following Christ does not mean that life improves in the physical sense. It does in the sense that you have true, everlasting joy and eternal life, but it doesn't mean that your physical circumstances uh, in, improve. Uh, actually, oftentimes it's... The opposite. Uh, to follow Christ is to suffer with him. So when you follow Jesus, you are going against the flow of the world and against what your flesh desires. And, and that brings with it suffering of some kind. It brings discomfort. It brings struggles of various kinds. So before you knew Christ, you just did whatever you wanted to do, right? And that's easy. If you felt like saying something, if you felt like doing something or acting a certain way, generally speaking, you would do it unless you would get in some, some serious trouble or there's bad consequences. You might restrain yourself a little bit, but by and large, you did what you wanted to do, right? You, uh, you did whatever your flesh desired. Now, when you follow uh, Christ, you're going against that desire, that natural sinful inclination, and it's not easy. Because even though if you're born again, you have a new heart, you have new desires, you have the indwelling Spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, but you still have a sinful nature that you're going to fight against until your final breath. And so the type of suffering that Peter is talking about here in our text is specifically suffering in the context of fighting against sin. So killing sin through suffering. The verse 1 again, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So when you think about the life of Christ, one of the first things that probably comes into your mind is his suffering. Right? Suffering seems to be synonymous with, with Jesus. Right? A, a cross is a picture of suffering. He suffered and died for our sin, and, and his suffering is what saves us. By his stripes, we are healed, right? He bore the suffering, the wrath that we deserve for our sin. If you look at chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For Christ also suffered 
once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Not only did Jesus die in order to justify us, to make us right before God, in his life he also suffered against sin itself while he was in the flesh. Right? He fought against and defeated every temptation to sin. Hebrews 4.15 tells us, Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. And when you think about a man, a person, never, ever giving into any temptation his entire earthly life, it, it's, it's a mind-boggling concept. How could any man do that? Well, we know Jesus was fully God and fully man, but we must not think that Jesus didn't have to struggle to fight against sin and temptation. He struggled and he suffered and he fought against sin because he was still fully man. But he won the battle every time because he was fully God as well. I mean, just look at the story of Jesus uh, in the, being tempted in the wilderness. Jesus had a physical body that was starving and naturally would be craving something like a loaf of bread, really anything that had Jesus given into the temptations of Satan, one of which was to turn stones into bread, he would have sinned, right? And so uh, he suffered through that temptation and resisted uh, the devil and conquered him. So Jesus suffered in the flesh and against sin and won every time. So if the Son of God, the incarnate Son of God, suffered to fight against sin, what does that mean for you and me? As, as one of his followers. Do you think that when you're converted uh, that you just kind of float on with no struggle against sin until you get to heaven? That you know, once you're born again, you're not susceptible to, to sin anymore. Or, you know, this is just it. You get saved and there's no struggle here. We, we, we're in Christ. We're going to heaven. And Peter says in the next chapter that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So when you're following Christ, you are a target. The enemy's going to attack you, going to entice you to sin, so you have to be ready to fight against temptation, against the devil, or you will be devoured. Now, how do we fight against sin? Peter says something very simple here. He says to arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, the same way of thinking of, of Christ, thinking about sin the same way that Jesus did. That is your, that is your, uh, your weapon, right? Thinking about sin as something that we suffer and fight against. That not giving into the passions of our flesh, which may be uncomfortable and unsatisfying at times, that is a worthy endeavor. That is a worthy fight. Notice that Peter says to arm, arm yourselves. That implies warfare. Not only does it imply warfare and, and a fight, but it implies that you can win, that you can defeat the enemy. You can be victorious. So if a soldier go, goes into battle, he arms himself with weapons that he believes are adequate to defeat the enemy. A soldier does not bring a knife to a gunfight. He brings a rifle. He might bring a sidearm. He might bring grenades and, and mortars and, and he can make sure he's got the radio to call in artillery and, and air support. He's going to bring all the weapons and tools that he believes will bring him victory. So you, are, you have to arm yourself to kill the enemy. And if you want to kill the enemy, if you want to kill sin, you arm yourself with the same way of thinking that Christ had. It's interesting that the way you think about sin is actually the weapon against it. What you think determines how you act. So if, if you do not have the same mindset about sin that Christ had, then you're not going to arm yourself with the spiritual weaponry you need to defeat sin. So you, you need to look at the life of Jesus, look at what he thought about sin, and, and follow his example, and have that same mindset that he did. And when you look at what Jesus thought about sin and taught about sin, you'll see he took it very seriously. He knew that suffering was essential in your fight against it. 
He said things like, you know, if your, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Sounds like suffering, right? Of course, it's metaphorical, uh, but the idea is that your fight against sin involves some level of suffering. And if you're a Christian, you have to understand that. It, it may be a temptation to think that God... Uh, that because God has saved you and, and has given you a new heart and that you can never go back then to the, the pigsty of sin. But you have to remember that inside you, in and of yourself, that lies no good thing, as the Apostle Paul said. You still have the propensity to sin and to sin greatly. And so you have to arm yourself with the thinking of Jesus that killing sin involves suffering. It involves saying no to your fleshly desires, going against the grain, going against your natural sinful inclinations. Galatians 5, 24 says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Peter uses that word a couple times here, passions, right? Colossians 3, 5, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual morality impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Putting to death, crucifying the flesh. These are violent terms, terms that imply warfare. So suffering in the flesh brings freedom from sin. This happens in conversion itself at that moment, or in the process of conversion, and it happens in the daily life of the believer. You have to suffer to get into the kingdom of God. As Jesus said, we're to fight to enter into the narrow gate. That fight, uh, the word he uses there, agonizomai, which we get the term agony from, uh, the, the, the fight to get in, that, that striving, that is a type of suffering. So our justification is a fight, and so is our sanctification, our growing in Christ, becoming more holy, is also a fight, and there is suffering Involved. So the suffering for sin does not end just when we're justified. It's really just the beginning. Right? It's, a, it's a new kind of suffering, a suffering that we didn't endure before. So as a believer in Christ, you have to be concerned with putting sin to death in your life every day. Because you know, before Christ, maybe you were a, a real mess of a person. You did all those big bad sins. You know, Maybe even some of the sins that Peter describes here in verse 3 but you've repented, you've trusted Christ, he's changed you, and you don't do those big, bad, obvious sins anymore. You don't go to drinking parties anymore, you're not a fornicator anymore, things like that. But what about those little sins, right? The, the little foxes in your life that spoil the vine, those, those kind of sinful nuances of your, your personality that you just kind of ignore. Those nagging sins that you can't seem to conquer, or maybe those nagging sins that you just don't care to conquer because you don't think it's a big deal or you think it's normal. How do you kill those sins? You have to arm yourself with the mind of Christ and suffer to kill those sins. What does Peter mean when he says, whoever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin? Does he mean that we become perfect, we become sinless, uh, that we're uh, immune to uh, the flesh? Well, we know that can't be the case because the Bible tells us in 1 John 1.18, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, right? And the truth is not in us. What it means to cease from sin through suffering in the flesh is actually, he defines it for us in verse 2. He says, Whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions but for the will of God. To suffer in the flesh and cease from sin means that for the rest of your life, your human existence here on earth, you're no longer enslaved to fleshly desires, but you live your life for the will of God. That's really what it means to be a Christian in general. Your, your main purpose in life is no longer to satisfy your desire your desires, but God's desires. Uh, that, that always involves some level of, of fleshly, bodily suffering. Not necessarily 
physical suffering. We're not talking about the self, in, you know, self-inflicted harm like the monks used to do in the in the Middle Ages or even before that. I remember hearing a story of a, a monk that, um, you know, dug a pit for himself to hide because he he had a problem lusting, right? He and so he wanted to hide from all forms of temptation. Dug a pit and just buried himself in there, not with dirt, but like covered himself. So he just lived in this pit, isolated, and it didn't work because he had thoughts in his own mind, right? So it's it's not physical tormenting uh, of yourself. That's not how we conquer sin. But it's constantly denying yourself, denying what your flesh wants in order that you might please God, in order that you would do His will. No longer living for human passions. No longer uh, living for fleshly Desires that involves suffering. One of the hot topic, hot button topics of our our day is, as you know, the the issue of sexuality, homosexuality, the LGBT agenda. You know, you have in June you see rainbows all over the place, right, in your face, and you have many who try to say that that lifestyle is compatible with Christianity, right? We know the scripture clearly teaches against it. That God's design for sexuality is one man, one woman in marriage, and God created us male and female. But people say things like, you know, God made me this way, if they're in that lifestyle, right? I didn't choose to be attracted to someone of the same gender. But what people need to hear is that if you want to follow Christ, you have to suffer in the flesh. You can't just give in to it. And that suffering as hard as it might be, it will bring freedom from sin. So the message for those in that lifestyle is that Christ can set you free from sin. He didn't create you so that you could live a self-destructive lifestyle for a few short years and die. He sent his son to suffer for your sin and he invites you to come and join him and to die to yourself and to give everything over to him, including things like your sexuality, and if, if you do that, Jesus will set you free from that bondage. Bondage, And there are countless testimonies of God's grace in saving people out of that lifestyle. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 that some of the Corinthians used to practice homosexuality, but they had been cleansed. They had been sanctified from that. They were delivered. Suffering in the flesh means freedom from sin. So it's not just suffering uh, you know, with, with no, nothing to, uh, no fruit of it, right? It's like giving birth is tremendous amount of suffering, but at least you have a baby at the end, right? It's not just pointless suffering. It's the same thing with, with sin. You fight, you suffer against it, but you're free from it. Another major problem today, I think, and even in the church is the issue of pornography, right? It's just as bad, they say, inside the church as outside. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it is a major problem. And men will have accountability partners uh, to, to help them and web filters and all these things, but you can get around all that. There's, you can lie to your accountability uh, partner. You can get around web filters. And I think the reason why so many Christian men and, and women now can't kick uh, this nagging sin of pornography is because they don't want to be uncomfortable. They don't want to suffer. They don't want to cut off their arm. They don't want to pluck out their eye. They want maybe instantaneous deliverance from the sin. They don't want to fight. They don't want to suffer for it. They are too comfortable and too spiritually lazy, and so they let that sin take hold of them. When the disciples couldn't drive out a demon, remember that story, Jesus... um, they asked Jesus about why couldn't we get this demon out? And I'm not saying it's demons that are causing this, this sin of pornography or anything, but just as an example, they said, Jesus said, and this kind can only be driven out by prayer and fasting, right? In other words, you have to work for it. If you want to be delivered from a nagging sin, whether it's sexual sin or some deeply rooted sin of personality, I'm sorry, but the only way you're going to be delivered is through suffering, If there's sin that will not die, go seek the Lord in prayer. And don't eat a crumb of food until he's delivered you. And that may sound too simplistic, and it may sound too inconvenient or uncomfortable, but I really believe that Scripture teaches 
that that is the way to kill sin in our lives. You have to really fight to be delivered. Whoever suffers in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Freedom from sin, killing sin, involves suffering, and this is something that is especially hard for us as modern-day Americans who aren't accustomed to suffering, really, for anything. You know, if you're hungry, you tap a few buttons on your phone and food shows up at your door. We don't really know what it's like to, to suffer, right? You, so you have to kind of break free from this modern, convenience-minded American way of thinking and arm yourself with the mind of Christ. And remember that we are called to suffer. So we always have to remember Christ in all of this. Remember that he suffered, he fought sin, and he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish it. Hebrews 12 3 and 4, it says, Consider him, remember Christ, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, suffering in the flesh, right? So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So I want to ask you today, in your struggle against sin, if you have one, which I hope you do, have you resisted to the point of shedding your blood? Right? Not literally, obviously. Is there a righteous suffering going on in your soul over sin? I think that's probably lacking in many of us, including myself, when we, when we are just not growing, keep dealing with the same sin over and over again. There isn't this righteous suffering in our life. We're just, we're just giving into it. Consider the suffering of Jesus. Follow his example. If, that's where, if you want to be set free, if you want real change and real growth in Christ, you have to fight and suffer. Look at verse 3. For the time that is past suffices for what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. In other words, all that stuff is, is done. Done with. That should be in the past. So, uh, some of the recipients of this letter from Peter had probably been committing those things on a regular basis before they were Christians. These were all common things in the Greco-Roman world. They were known for those things, the drinking parties. You know, I've heard of the symposium. They would get together and, and drink and talk philosophy and get drunk and all kinds of debauchery. It says those things are in the past. That is not how you were to be living now. The past is good for that. Let that stuff be in the past, what the Gentiles are doing now. That's not how you were to be living now as a Christian. Those, uh, those sins that he listed there are uh, human passions, doing whatever you feel like, indulging in, in all kinds of fleshly urges that you have. And that's what the Gentiles do. That's what the pagans do, the unbelievers, not the Christian. The Christian does not live a life for their own passions, but for the will of God. A life of self-indulgent sin is to be in the past where it belongs. For the Christian, it's washed under the, the blood of the Lamb. It's forgotten. It's cast into the, the depths of the sea. In verse 4, with respect to this, they, the unbelievers, Gentiles, they are surprised when you do not join in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. So in your fight against sin, you're going to encounter mistreatment and being spoken against by people because you don't partake in the same sinful activities that they do. It may not be the same list there, obviously, but many other, you can add any other thing to that. People will malign you. They'll speak evil of you because you're not doing what, what they're doing. And you don't use the same kind of language. You don't live the same kind of lifestyle. You don't act the, the way that they act. And they don't like that. This too is part of the suffering in the flesh against sin. There will be pressure, right, to join in with unbelievers in their sin. Like I mentioned, uh, those sins he talks about in verse 3 were, were common occurrences in that pagan culture. And likewise, in our culture today, people will kind of uh, expect you to partake in the things that, that they do, and when you don't, they may very well malign you and mistreat you because of it. So, that is another type of suffering that you are expected to endure in your fight against 
sin. And this is especially important, I think, for young people, young Christians to remember, because they're uh, pressured probably even more than adults, adult Christians. Peer pressure is a terrible thing, and and many young Christians struggle with it because um, I think they're not really encouraged or taught to suffer through that and and to be willing to be maligned. They're truly a, a Christian. They have to be ready to, to fight against uh, the pressure that is put upon them to join in with the crowd, um, uh, you know, living, uh, going according to their, their passions. Uh, and certainly, we know, you know parents should seek to, to put an end to that when we find out about it. Uh, but we also have to train our, our children uh, who are believers to stand firm on their biblical convictions and always remember the Lord Jesus Christ and all the suffering that he endured. One of the ways that we can be encouraged to, to suffer through being maligned, through peer pressure and things like that, is found in verse 5. He says, But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So you have to remember the promises of God that God will judge even the secret things of the heart by Christ Jesus and that everyone will have to give an account for everything that they've ever done. Jesus said, you will have to give an account for every foolish word that you've ever spoken. So unbelievers might mock you, they might ridicule you uh, here for not living the same way that they do, but it doesn't matter because God sees and hears what they're doing and one day they will face the justice of a holy God if they don't repent and believe in his son. The chapter 2, verse 23 When he, when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So Jesus was maligned and mistreated far worse and far more undeservingly than you and I will ever be. And what did he do? He had faith that God was just and that God would make this all right. And if Jesus thought that way, so should you. So don't worry about what people say to you or about you because you are pursuing holiness and Christ-likeness and they're pursuing sin and debauchery. Their end is destruction if they don't repent. They will face a holy, righteous, just God. Your sins have been paid for by the blood of Christ. You've been made right with God and you live to do his will and you don't live for your human passions anymore like they do. Verse 6, for this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So this whole idea of killing sin and, and suffering to defeat sin, this is a kind of dangerous notion, a dangerous thing to say to an unconverted person, especially an unconverted religious person, an unconverted person who goes to church or something like that. Because if you're not born again, you'll never be able to kill sin. You might give up some bad habits. You might turn over a new leaf. You might strive to become more moral, but you're still in your sin. After saying all this about suffering and not living for human passions, Peter says, this is why the gospel was preached. This is why the gospel was preached. Why? Because the gospel is the only means by which you can suffer against sin and actually win. Repent and believe the gospel and you'll be able to defeat sin. Without the gospel, this is all just a work of the flesh. It's just a fleshly attempt to to please God through moral living. And that itself is a fleshly desire to want to please God through just working and doing good. What you need to do is turn away from your sin and really believe and put your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to believe your good works could never save you. You have to believe that faith in Christ and and everything that he's done, his merit alone, is sufficient to save you. And when you're truly trusting in Christ, you'll be given the power of the Holy Spirit who enables you to live a life no longer for your own lusts, your own passions, but you live a life for the will of God. So what does he mean exactly when he says, you know, the gospel being preached to the dead. Uh, 
For this is why the gospel is preached, even those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So in other words, the gospel was preached to people who are now dead. So does that mean, okay, they preached the gospel, but they're dead, so what's the, is the gospel powerless? It says, judge the way people are, right? All people are judged in the sense that we all die, right? Everyone's going to die. The soul that sins shall die. Uh, we, the wages of sin is death. We've been cut off from the, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. We can't live forever anymore, like Adam and Eve had the possibility to do, uh, but we've been kicked out of the garden because of sin, uh, and we can't have access to the tree of life. We're not going to live forever, and, and so we're going to die because of our sin, physically. So in that sense, we're judged. Everybody is. But the gospel was preached even to people who have died, so that they might live again, that they may live in the spirit the way that God does, without a corruptible body, without sin and without death. That is how God lives, and that is the fruit of the gospel, eternal life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So if you believe uh, the gospel, your physical body will die, but your spirit will live the way God does, because Christ is the, the true tree of life, and he gives us that uh, eternal life through, the, through faith in him. And, and that, is, that is what we look to. That is our hope. That is what makes this temporary suffering in the flesh in this life worth it. The gospel is our hope, not our own moral striving. And I'll close with just a few points of application. Number one, I've already touched on some of these, but just kind of to summarize, um, if you're trying to please God by living a more moral life, just being a better person, um, you need to stop doing that. What you need to do is believe the gospel, look to the crucified, risen Savior, believe him, believe that his work was sufficient for you, and when you believe the gospel, now you'll have power to defeat sin. You'll be born again. You'll be a new creature. You'll have the Holy Spirit. You'll have the power to defeat sin. Now, number two, for the Christian, always remember that suffering is essential to defeat sin. I think we always have to have that in our minds, that, that, that fighting against sin involves suffering, and that's a good thing. That is, a, a, that is the, the, the norm to suffer for sin. And it's not a bad thing. It's never easy. It's not supposed to be. Always remember that Christ suffered and he expects the same from us. So you have to arm yourself with the same way of thinking that Christ had, and that is that you have to suffer against sin. That it is a thing to be suffered against. It's not, not something that we're passive with. Uh, thirdly, always ask yourself something like this. Is what I desire to do or to think or, or, or to say is that what my flesh wants to do, or is this the will of God? Am I seeking to please my flesh or God? In any situation, anything you want to think or say or do, act, is what I'm about to say, the thing I want to say right now, is that pleasing to God, or is it just pleasing my flesh? Is it pleasing your flesh to speak that way, or to do that thing, or is it just what your old nature wants to do? Resist those fleshly urges uh, and, and suffer to do that. It involves suffering. It involves going against the flow, against your nature. I think oftentimes, maybe even most of the time we could say, uh, your initial impulse, your reaction to something, oftentimes could be flesh. The first thing that comes into your mind to do or say or think something. A lot of times it's just your flesh. So we need to pause Think before you say something or act. Like James says, be slow to speak, right? Quick to listen, slow to speak. Why, why do we have to be slow to speak? Because usually when we, we say something out of whether anger or something else, it's, it's usually our flesh because that's our first reaction. So slow to speak, quick to listen. So may God help us then to die every day to our, ourselves to go against the grain to, to, to kill our sin through suffering, right? arming ourselves with the same thinking that Jesus 
had. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would give us the same mind of Christ. Arm us, Lord, with the same way of thinking that Jesus had, that we are to suffer against sin. Lord, what we think determines how we act, and we need to think about our sin. We need to be active in pursuing it and killing it and suffering and not giving it to our fleshly desires. So help us to do that, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to remember your Son always. We'll remove any um, temptation to to strive to please you through our own uh, moral um, doing or our performance, Lord, but to really Lord, suffer for the sake of Christ and remember that you suffered for us, Lord, and you invite us to come and suffer for you. Help us to do that. Help us to bring glory to your name. Help us to grow more like Christ. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.